Hi, hello, welcome to the October 18th, 2022 Club Cubase live stream. I'm going to do a quick audio test and then we will go ahead and begin. Bear with me just for a moment. Hi, hello, welcome to. All right, my name is Greg Undo. I'll be the host of the live stream today. Um, and if you've not attended a live stream before, how it works is we can submit questions in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de, or you can just simply ask your questions live in the chat field. Um, so when asking questions, if you could uh, sometimes specify, if you could specify which level of Cubase that you're using, whether it's Cubase uh LE, AI, Elements, Artist, or Pro, which level, so if it's 10, 11, version 12, or other Steinberg programs, and which operating system, that information would be helpful. Um, and when asking questions, uh, I may not be able to keep up with the questions in real time, um, but what... Do, uh, but I'll try to do my best so if we could avoid asking the same questions over and over again, that would be helpful. Um, you know, just kind of slows down the whole process. We should have all the topics that are covered in today's live stream uh, pinned to the top of the comments field later this evening with timestamps. Uh, and if you wanted to search for topics that have been covered in previous live streams, you could go to cubaseindex.com. And uh, thanks to Jan from Stockholm, who's been kind enough to create that website for us. Um, so I want to give special thanks to Jan for that. And you can search over 21,000 uh, user questions. Uh, when uh, Also, we have two people that serve as moderators. And what they're not Steinberg employees, so they just kind of do this. They volunteer their time for this to make it a better community experience. We want to give special thanks to uh, Jazz Dude and to... Um, and to Agent K for their efforts with that. So it makes it a better live stream. It's very much appreciated. We also, uh, another great resource of information that's really relevant and pertinent to the Steinberg community. You could check out the Cubase Nation Discord in addition to all the, the official Steinberg uh, resources. Uh, and Jazzdude does a lot of work with that. Um, so with that, we will go ahead and uh, begin the questions. Uh, just a quick note. I, I got emails. We had our uh, prize contest uh, last week, and I don't think I got uh, emails from Jazz Dude or Steve Allen. So if you get a chance to email to clubcubase at steinberg.de so we can get your prize sent out to you, that would be appreciated. I think I heard from everyone else, uh, and that was a lot of fun doing the trivia. So let's go ahead and get started. We just jump. I think we had one question got cut off that was submitted earlier. Let me just find it. Um, so we had a question that was uh, typed in the chat earlier before the live stream started. Um, so it was question, MIDI and audio images uh, don't line up with the grids in the project window in Cubase 12. Never had this before in Cubase 12. Any help? It's very disorienting. So the one thing, I think this is an issue that was kind of uh, came up in 1204 that should hopefully be uh, resolved soon. But if you go to Preferences, try going to Event Display to MIDI. And when you see Part Data Mode, uh, try to set this to Lines as opposed to Blocks. And I think that will help temporarily until uh, probably the next maintenance release will probably take care of that. Okay, let me go back to my chat. Okay, all right, so we see, and also if you're watching this, I'm presenting from uh, Alexandria, Virginia. If you're on the live stream live, please feel free to introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. Um, all right, so we see Vishnu checking in from India. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so we have a question. Uh, how can I export all the preferences of mine in Cubase 12 to use in a new installation so that the keyboard shortcuts, appearances, uh, et cetera, stay the same. So if you go to your edit menu and we will just choose the profile manager and you could export all of your profile and that will be all of your preferences, your user created presets, um, you know, so just about all of your different settings. So just export that out of the computer that you want it to migrate the settings over. And to the, in the new computer, just go to import 
and import that same exact profile. So try that. All right, so we see Peter uh, from Montreal says, outrunning errands with my wife today. I'm sitting in a parking lot waiting for the stream to begin while she does the running. All right, I think Peter had sent in a question uh, earlier. Uh, so let me get to that. So see if we catch him between uh, before he may have to go in to do some additional shopping. Uh, so his question was, um, is there a way to clear the insert chain on a given channel in one fell swoop? Okay, so let's come over here to, um, I'll just put some inserts on a particular track. So let's say if I come here, and we'll look at all the inserts. So if I wanted to, I think it's if we just grab the, so we see our inserts here, we could bypass them all. But if I wanted to get rid of all of the inserts in that particular in that particular track, if I click while holding down control or command, it'll ask you, do you want to reset the track? And you could say reset, and then all the inserts will be kind of eradicated from the particular track. So let me know if that helps, Peter. Thanks for sending your question in advance. All right, so we have Valid checking in uh, from uh, Vienna, and we have Stefan saying hi from Sweden. We see Jazz Dude on. We always appreciate all the efforts and the help that Jazz Dude offers. Uh, and we have Robbie Bowling from Dallas, Texas. Um, All right, so we have uh, I see a question from Dallas LaRue. says, uh, error message in Howley and Sonic, uh, T guitar, preload memory, 1200 megabytes, increased preload memory or reduced preload time. Please explain. So when we deal with samples uh, in instruments like Howley and uh, Howley and Sonic, you know, basically the very beginning of the sample is loaded into RAM and the rest of it will stream from the hard disk. Uh, so it used to be a lot of samples were limited to only working in RAM and you had very limited numbers of RAM, but when you start dealing with, uh, hard disk streaming samples, then that offers, you know, the ability to run much more, uh, complex samples. Uh, so if you go to the options, uh, inside of Howie and Sonic SE3, you could see your max preload. So, you know, depending on how much memory you have in your particular computer, you could increase the max preload time. And what that will do is um, if you had only like 1.2 uh, gigs allocated for Halion and you're loading up a large sample library, you could just simply increase that. So, you know, you could try doubling it or, you know, doing a multiple times four, but you could just simply come over here and just increase the max preload. And then the samples will be loaded into memory so it doesn't have to stream it, uh, stream the rest off of the hard disk. So it kind of allows you to buffer the samples into your computer's memory. So if you had four, you know, four gigs of RAM, you know, 1.2 gigs, I have 64 gigs in my computer, so I could increase this to have more preload memory available for samples to play back instead of kind of think of it like a hose, you know, putting your thumb at the end of a hose and, you know, and then being able to release it, you know, you could, uh, so just allowing you to adjust how much of the samples are loaded ahead of time. All right, wonderful to see John Costigan from Kenosha, Wisconsin. And we have Benny from Sweden. Mike Chatfield just jumped. Uh, so we have a question from Benny. He says, I use Supervision and VU meter. My master volume is at zero dB, but the meters in the VU supervision significantly lower than the VU meters. What could be wrong, Cubase 12? Okay, so let's say I'm looking at my, I'll just repeat this. And we look at the meters here. So it looks like we're kind of close. To zero, and then when we go to our control room, let's look at our supervision. 
So it looks like our meters here are very low. So what you want to do is just to come here and instead of VUDB, try VUDB uh, FS. And then, so this way you're actually kind of seeing the DB full scale. So set the metering to full scale and then you should kind of see the that should make sense. So instead of setting it for true VU, we want to set it to VU DB full scale or FS. And then I think that will kind of align to what you want it to be. All right, so we see uh, Elton from Malta it just says, hi Greg, uh, thanks for these tutorials. You're welcome, I'm just glad to be able to help people. Um, so we see, uh, hi Greg, have a great day. Do we have a gain plugin in Cubase? Um, there's a number of ways to do it, but every channel, once you go to like the channel EQ, there's a, a gain here. You could just simply adjust so you get 48 dB of gain or cut just by clicking right there. In the pre section, there's a number of plugins if you wanted to adjust gain that will be pre fader gain um, but if you wanted to just come over here and have inserts you know you could come over to say i wanted to have like a studio eq and i wanted to just adjust the gain here so there's a number of plugins that have gain adjustment but every single channel in the pre section and we could access that from the channel eq you could adjust the gain directly there. So no plugin is necessary, it's just part of the channel strip. All right, so we see Jazz Dude, he says he'll email for his uh, 250th uh, live stream prize. So I wanna make sure we include you and we appreciate all of your efforts and everything you do for the community. And we see John Costigan got his MIDI tracks that we discussed on the last live stream in. It's wonderful. We have Soren in Sweden. All right. So we have Damir. Uh, just says, love your stream, Greg. So thank you for that. Okay, so we have a question uh, If I from Dallas LaRue in Las Vegas. Uh, if I install Cubase 11 on his second computer, that will be a fresh version without third-party plugins. So correct, uh, you know, just installing, um, you know, Cubase 11 doesn't, you know, doesn't install your third-party plugin. So just be independent of that. All right, and we see Damir just uh, says, greeting to all, greetings to all from Houston, Texas. <clears throat> I'm just going to Houston. My brother lives there in Bel Air area. Works at the Texas Medical Center. All right, um, okay, so we just see, um, all right, so this might be a follow, uh, kind of a continuation of Patrick's question about the gain. It says, do we have a gain plugin in Cubase? Um, like if I had an EQ in track gain is increased, uh, to I guess 2 dB in master channel, so it's peaking, so gain stage after adding effects. So, you know, once you come over here, you know, you could adjust it, you know, beforehand, uh, like we just said, or any number of, um, you know, so this would be pre-gain, and then you could come over and have your various uh, effects and be able to adjust uh, gain and if you wanted the if it was the EQ that was adding gain uh, what you could do is just simply if you needed to switch the signal order of that if you click here um, you could just kind of swap the signal flow of the EQ to come before the inserts or after the inserts like that All right, so we see a question from Dowski. Uh, Hi, Greg, how to colorize all tracks the same color when they're grouped? Okay, so all you had to do is, let's say I wanted to take a number of tracks here, 
that we're uh, I'm going to select the color tool so and it's this tool it looks like a paint can and then we could select the color and you want to make sure that no single events are selected so if I want to do tracks uh, again select the paint tool select and now we could colorize multiple tracks at once just like that so whatever track is selected, you can just apply the paint tool and select your color accordingly. All right, so we have Mr. O saying, uh, just checking in from Cali, Colombia in South America. Thanks for all the help. So you're welcome. Thanks for joining us. All right, uh, so we see from the Heartbreak Time Machine, uh, is there a preset a bas or slash best practice for splitting Groove Agent's outputs? So kick, et cetera, kick, snare are on different outputs. It's pretty easy to do. Um, I'll show you both for a, an acoustic agent kit as well as uh, like a beat agent kit. So with an acoustic agent kit, what we could do is, you know, once we're in uh, the instrument pads here. So let's say if we're looking at the instrument and we go to the mixer. So if I hit my kick, we see kit mix here, and then you could just assign your outputs. So there's not, I don't think that there is a particular preset for the outputs because a lot of people will do all the mixing internally. But if you wanted to go to one of the 32 stereo outputs, you could just click here. So go in, make sure you have the instrument tab. Uh, I guess it doesn't matter if you're an instrument, but go select the mixer. And then where it says kit mix, at that point, we want to assign the different outputs accordingly as we want. If it's on a beat agent kit, where it's kind of more like a sampling drum machine paradigm, as we click on different areas, we'll see right here as we click on the pad each pad will have a bus and then we can again set it to one of our 32 stereo outputs so and this would be on the instrument and the edit and on the main tab so you could just simply come here and have these automatically assigned to independent outputs that will then populate in the mixer automatically Wonderful to see Tim Weinheimer on the live stream from Mission Viejo, so he's not far from our office. We have a lot of people working at Yamaha in America that live in Mission Viejo. All right, we have Michael Marshall checking in from Somerset, UK. We're glad you could join us today. And Uno Memento from Finland. Great to have you as well. All right, so we have uh, Fadi checking in from Jordan. Thanks for being a part of the live stream. Matt Elston from London, loyal attendee. Uh, so we have a question, uh, does Cubase difficult? Um, you know, so I find Cubase to be pretty intuitive to use. It does a tremendous amount of things, but you don't necessarily have to use it. Kind of my snarky answer to that often is, you know, it's uh, Stevie Wonder runs it, so it can't be that hard if we have a lot of blind users running it. So, but I think it's a pretty in intuitive program. Um, like when I kind of first got my Cubase, I remember I was in college, this is my last semester of college, and I got home on a Sunday night with my copy of Cubase and uh, I did a project the next day and, you know, I made $150 profit. So I thought Cubase was great. $150 profit in like 12 hours. It's great. Okay, so we see Three Dog Recording Studio just saying, uh, I want to thank you, Greg, for pointing me in a direction I needed uh, with the hit points. Uh, that he ended up finding a solution. So thanks for letting us know. All right. So we have Serhi checking in from Ukraine. Thanks for being on. Hope that everything is safe where you're at. All 
All right, so we see a uh, question. How can I get rid of all the copies from reversing in the media bay? I do reverse a lot, and this is getting out of hand. Um, so, you know, media bay is there to kind of report uh, everything that's in, you know, all the audio files that you've picked within a particular folder. Um, but I think that you could that there is a way of, you know, if you wanted to, like, as we do a search, that there is kind of, uh, like, some bullying conditions. So let's say if I was here, um, so we could say, um, So you could say, you know, if it, if you name the files like reverse, you could just say, um, you know, um, search for any attribute that omits reverse. So you have kind of different Boolean conditions directly here. So you could just say, um, you know, so you could just search for conditions that are equal to it. Uh, but, you know, I mean, Media Bay is supposed to show you all of the media that's available in your system. So, all right. Uh, so, I see from uh, says question uh, What software you use for streaming? So, I'm using. Uh, the OBS, so I, I kind of just use OBS and uh, I take my audio out of Cubase from an audio interface, a UR24C, and my microphone into a Yamaha mixer that has a USB out. I used a Yamaha mixer for the audio, but everything else uh, goes directly from OBS, so that's just kind of sharing. Um, so it's just sharing my uh the screen okay uh so we see from mr o says i have massive problems with changing tempo and having my audio clips stay in sync they are all in musical mode but audio clips randomly fall to sync some stay in sync some don't you know so if you know, it could be, you know, when you're doing, you know, like musical mode, you want to make sure that, you know, if the audio is a steady tempo, it's fine to have just one kind of value that we could see reflected in the pool window. So if I come here and say, okay, this is 100 and, you know, this particular future chill loop is 120 beats and my project's at 100 beats a minute, but this isn't fluctuating tempo if you have something that is fluctuating tempo so let's say um and i wanted it to follow in musical mode accurately what you would need to do is to do a tempo detection of the events and you could do this by going to your project menu to tempo detection analyze it so even though you're like oh this may be um set up where as we're working with this <clears throat> that um you know we have fluctuations in tempo so if the audio itself is fluctuating tempo and you have one value then there's a good chance that it's not going to be as accurate and it could fluctuate so what you need to do if we have all these tempo changes here in this file uh, we could now go to the audio to advanced and we'll say set definition from tempo. And what we could do is basically embed all these tempo changes that we see here on the files. And at this point, we could save it in the project or write it to the particular audio file. You could choose either way. Um, and now when I do this, I could change the tempo to any tempo that I want. And it'll be totally steady. So if I want to be 166. So what it's doing is now knows what the tempo fluctuations are. 
And then once we apply, embed that metadata into the files through, again, audio to advance to set definition from tempo, then we could, you know, do whatever tempo changes we want and it'll be accurate. But if you have like one static tempo value for an audio file that's fluctuating, you often will run into what you describe. Uh, so you just see, is there any alternative to split tool from Studio One in Cubase? So, I mean, we have a split tool, so I don't know Studio One, um, but if we wanted to, uh, let's say if I had a number of tracks, you know, we could just, you know, grab the scissors tool and cut. So if you wanted to cut individual parts, um, so, you know, if you wanted to say, okay, I wanted to erase that. Uh, if you wanted to hold down the alt key, you could say, okay, I want to split uh, at measure 17 on this event, and I wanted to hold down the alt or option key. Then at measure 18, we could have it automatically split. If we wanted to split a folder track or do global cuts, I think it's just, um, you could just go to edit. And then there's, you know, split function. So if, as you kind of come over here, you could just, uh, I think just, let's see if I can remember the keyboard shortcut. So if I wanted to split here, I could just hit Alt X and then that would um, split everything here globally. So now I could just see um, like that, but let me know if there's, um, and then you could also just kind of do range editing. So if this is what you mean by split, we could also just kind of come over here and say, okay, I want to delete time or, uh, so let me know if that's kind of what you were thinking of, but a lot of the split functionalities are just done with the scissors tool, but let me know if I'm kind of misunderstanding or if there's something unique about the tool in the other application. All right, so we see the Heartbreak Time Machine says he's been to Yamaha USA in uh, MV for training. So yeah, it's actually the office is in Buena Park, and if MV stands for Mission Viejo, but yeah, it's not too far. All right, uh, so we see from Robbie Bowling says uh, last two days while booting Cubase 12, when 10 got an error message saying my UAD Apollo had been removed from the computer. Not true. Had to use Task Manager to close and reboot. Um, and he said, and also just mentions I, I do still have Cubase 11 on a computer. It rescanned and booted just fine. Um, so generally, you know, like if it's, you know, make sure that it's like if you have any of our programs that might be utilizing the audio interface, sometimes some different programs may not release the driver if you're using it for YouTube or something like that. Uh, but generally those messages are kind of, you know, it's just a message from the audio interface just saying, you know, we can't find it. So it's usually kind of uh, dependent upon the hardware for that. Uh, but let me know if you still can't get it, um, you know, but if you have it, you like communicating with a different uh, audio program that might, um, that might uh, also be a culprit there, Robbie. Okay, uh, so we see a question, does side chaining work the same with group channels? Yeah, so it sure does. So if I wanted to come and take, let's say, all my drums and route these to a particular group. And then if we wanted to just do side chaining on the group, 
we could do that. Or if we wanted to use the group as a sidechain input, we could come over here. Um, and let's say if I have my inserts here and we go put a dynamics plug in and we'll say compressor. And when we go to our enable sidechain and we come here, we'll get to our sidechain input and we can now select the drum group as a sidechain input. Or if you want it to, you know, use uh, the compressor here um, on the sidechain, we could just say, okay, I want to take this and we have our compressor plug in and we come over and we add the sidechain source on the group, let's say from the sub kick, we, we could, you know, sidechain the source or use the group as a sidechain input as well. All right, so great to have Rob uh, from Tarpon Springs, Florida. Hope you didn't get uh, any storm damage a couple weeks ago. All right, so you just see uh, audio to MIDI in Cubase. Um, so it work, it's designed to work for kind of monophonic sources. So if I have a monophonic source here, we could go into Vary Audio and go to Edit Vary Audio, and this will do the analysis. And then directly from the uh, function, we could just choose to extract MIDI. And at that point, we could just create a MIDI track. Uh, so it's not intended for like chords or piano parts, but for monophonic sources. So let me know if that's helpful. Great to have Spike Williams checking in from Wales, and we have Michael Teams checking in from Weatherford, Texas. That means the virtual ice cream distribution will begin. All right, Michael Teams wants people to smash the like button. So if you have learned a new tip or trick or just like the live streams, make sure you hit the like button and that you subscribe to the channel. All right, uh, so we see from Benny, says question regarding about uh, reverence last time that Cubase doesn't load, it happens when I start Cubase, but when Cubase is running, I'm able to open it, it works. Uh, what could be wrong? So if you wanna send me just a screenshot of, um, you know, what message you're getting, Benny, you could send it to club Cubase at steinberg.de. Um, so, but one other thing that it could be is, you know, reverence will have different impulse responses. Uh, so maybe it's just missing some of the impulse responses. Maybe some, not all of them are installed. So, um, yeah, so check to see if I think it's, um, you know, so maybe it's just not seeing all of the uh, impulse responses. So you might get a message for that. All right, uh, so we see, do we have a question from Rich B? Uh, do we have access to the gain in the inspector view when selecting a track? Um, so, you know, there's a couple ways to, so, you know, we could have the volume control here on the selected track. Uh, if you have an event here, you could also, not from the inspector, but from the info line, if you wanted to increase gain directly here, there's a volume adjustment that you can make for an additional 24 dB of gain or cut. And that's also pre-fader, so it's not in the, you know, this will be like your mixer fader volume. So as we come here, we could adjust the mixer fader, but if you wanted to adjust like pre-gain, you know, just come right here and then you could adjust the volume uh, directly there as well. So let me know if that's helpful. All 
Okay, just reading through comments. All right. Um, all right. So we have a question from Heartbreak Time Machine. Uh, how do you use supervision to find phasing issues uh, in my 40 to 250 hertz range? Okay. So let's say um, one of the plugins, one of the meters inside of supervision. Uh, so I'll come here. Let's go to phase. Uh, and you could go to a multi panorama. Let's see if this is the one I'm. Maybe multi, go to R1 here. So here, what you could actually do is you could see exactly which frequencies are out of phase. So let's say if I wanted to take uh, one of my kick drums here, and I'll just knock this out of phase, and we'll see if that causes overheads but as we do this any frequencies that are out of phase you'll see these red lines so this is kind of a phase meter so what's uh, in kind of the aqua blue is in phase and what's in red so this way you could actually kind of and as you hover over you could see the exact frequencies that are in and out of phase right here. So use the multi-correlation meter just for that, and that will easily kind of point out the which frequencies are in or out of phase so you could isolate it a bit. All right, so we see Tim Samsung uh, just saying, uh, any plans to make Cubase MIDI slave? So, you know, I don't think so because, you know, when you're doing a MIDI slave, the resolution is really poor. So if you have Cubase being MIDI slave, the audio is not going to stay in sync uh, because, you know, the, the inherent, you know, core resolution of Cubase is at the sample level. So, you know, having it slave, kind of like how we, you know, we have a, a drum machine that doesn't have sample accurate synchronization capabilities, that makes more sense. But when we're dealing with, you know, sample accurate different elements, the, you know, the resolution of MIDI clock uh, is too coarse for, for it to actually synchronize correctly. So that's why you don't see a lot of DAWs that are, you know, uh, having MIDI slave, um, just because, you know, everything is kind of based on the sample position. All right, wonderful to see Kerwin Young back. We missed you, hope you're doing well. Just reading through comments. All right, so we see from Kerwin Young, it says, uh, I'm in the studio working and watching this at the same time. Uh, quite busy. Well, it's great to be busy. Uh, I'd like to know if the Akai MPC Studio can control Groove Agent. So, you know, when we're working with Groove Agent, Groove Agent can respond to uh, any MIDI, incoming MIDI data. So, you know, it shouldn't be any problem being able to uh, sequence and being able to play all the sounds easily from your Akai uh, MPC, so no problem, and especially when you're in Beat Agent, it's kind of very analogous to uh, the paradigms of an MPC, but just kind of in software form with with a lot more flexibility and memory. So,
Okay. Okay, uh, so just see a uh, question. Uh, when I try to stream with Cubase, my audio won't play back on the stream. Um, how do you set up your audio for streaming? So, you know, you, there are like, and I think I could do it with, you know, I, I know I could do it with my UR interfaces where it's, um, you know, you can have a loopback function. So many audio interfaces like the Steinberg UR and AXR interfaces have loopback functions where you could have that automatically be sent to the stream. What I do, and it's just a, a system that I set up that's so I don't have to do any thinking of it because I have to, you know, read all the questions, answer questions succinctly, hopefully, and monitor everything is I take my audio out from my audio interface into a Yamaha mixer. I take my microphone into the Yamaha mixer. That also allows me if I have to cough or, you know, my son knocks on the door and asks a question that I can mute my microphone and OBS. I'm using the Yamaha mixer for the audio for that. There's other systems, you know, there's a uh, voice meter banana. Uh, I think it's, um, you know, voice meter, uh, which is another utility for windows, um, but I find that if you have the system I have kind of using two different audio interfaces is just kind of a, you know, I never have to think about sample rates or setting up an input for my microphone. So, um, all right. So we just see, uh, a question uh, in mixed view: Is there a keyboard shortcut to quickly scroll left and right without actually having to grab the small scroll bar? So, if we wanted to come, um, I'll just make my mixer bigger here. So, you know, just if you don't want to do it, you could just kind of hover over and use the uh, scroll wheel. So you don't actually have to grab it, but just hanging out over there. If you have a channel selected, you could also just hit the left and right arrows to navigate just like that as well. And then that will allow you to scroll through all the different tracks in your project. So just the left, right arrows on your particular, on your computer keyboard. All right, uh, so we just say, you see a question. Um, uh, Greg, while recording MIDI, every notes are different in length. If I want to change every note to 16th note triplets, is it possible uh, like its length and ends should be in perfect 16th triplet grids? Okay, so let's say I want it to Just do a new project here. Okay, so let's say I'll just play some random MIDI notes here. Okay, so let's say I just have different, um, I want to turn every note into 16th note triplets and to be 16th note uh, a 16 triplet long. Um, so let's say I'm going to come and let's just set my quantize value to 16th note triplets. All right. And then I'm just going to hit Q. And then we could also, to change the length, if we go to advanced quantize, we could say quantize uh, MIDI event lengths. And then we could quantize those to 16th note triplets. Um, 
And let's say if we want it, you know, so let's say, so right now we could have that. And if you want it to all be not just quantized to lengths, but have the, the length of the notes, let's see if we can do that in a logical editor as well. Um, so let's see, and then you could just kind of set, um, so let's see, triplets, um, so let's just, I'll just put this value in. So now you could adjust the length of So you could, and you, I, you know, so this would be a 16th note, and so I think this would be 160. Let's just find a value here. So I think this is assuming it's, okay, so we're at 120, so let's make this 80. I think I may be wrong in my math. But now every single note can be a 16th triplet. So you could just kind of set the particular value so you get a transform type is equal to midi note and set the length to fixed value and then you can find the 16th note triplet in the ppq settings so let me know if that helps all right so we have a question uh is it possible to change the pitch bend the pitch bend default range from the sampler track um So I think it's going to be the same. You could start off with, you know, so, we, you know, here it's going to be set to uh, a whole tone up and a whole tone down. Uh, if you start the sampler track with a track preset, so let's say if I add a sampler track, and then let's say I want this to be an octave, um, so I don't think that there's a way to save this as a default, but once you come over here, you could just say, you know, save it as a track preset, and then you could open it up that way, but it's usually pretty easy to change, but I don't know a way other than kind of a track preset where to apply um, the pitch to change the default pitch bend range. Okay, so we see a question from Lawrence Koch. Uh, just, he's just saying, uh, just wondering if anyone hasn't had issues on Windows 10 PC with the WDMOD.DRV causing Cubase to freeze. I'm working with tech support, but I figure I'd ask. So I'm not familiar with that. Um, but if you want to send me an email, Lawrence, I'd be happy to kind of see if I could, you know, if you don't hear back from support, uh, we could see. So I'm not sure if it's... Um, yeah, what driver that is. Um, all right, so we see from Demir says, Greg, what are your favorite MIDI effects and are they worth using? So I think the MIDI effects are really kind of underutilized. Um, 
you know, just having the ability to, you know, come over and I'll just switch projects here easily. But let's say if I was just playing, um, So say if I have like kind of just a quick synth bass part, I can come over to um, so like my MIDI inserts. So, you know, I like, you know, just even like, you know, simple arpeggiators are fun, you know. So I'm just holding a chord, I switch one note in a chord. And even while I'm holding a chord, if I hit one of the notes with a higher velocity, You know, you could, you know, do different stuff like that if you wanted to invert or up only. And I think a lot of people always go to for default 16th notes, but, you know, do like different rhythmic values. I think a lot of people don't miss this where, you know, you could have a drum beat and it's, and it's maybe doing, uh, you know, dotted eighth notes played against, let's say we have a, a drum beat here. Uh, and I want my step size to be dotted eighth notes, you know. You know, try different rhythmic values instead of just eighths or sixteenths. Uh, also, I really like uh, for composers that are doing a lot of like, I need like this initial value to be set, the MIDI controls, I think are really good. So you say, okay. When I open up this particular track, I need the modulation wheel to default to 89 for this particular library. Uh, the quantizer plugin is also very powerful. So if you wanted to come over here and just add, you know, it's kind of like classic Teddy Riley new jack swing. You can just take any MIDI part and put that slide that over. It's one of Teddy's favorites. Um, and, you know, getting into... You know, all, you know, so all these are like, you know, really pretty powerful stuff. You know, if you want to get into LFOs, where this could generate LFOs to, you know, different plug-in parameters and instruments. So, you know, you know, if you have like an hour, just, you know, try to get, uh, you know, one of the MIDI plugins, you know, just, just explore them because there's really very creative results. All right, so we see uh, Filter Freak just says, uh, question, uh, audio to MIDI function, how do you use the intensity function? Because every time I try to convert to MIDI, it's not what I'm expecting. So let me just jump back to the other project. So let's say if I'm in my very audio, so you know, sometimes going through the very audio and cleaning up segments can also, you know, make a big difference. Like, you know, if you see that, um, you know, like these two notes here or just, sorry, I'm, my armrest is, you know, just like where you see, you know, different notes like this, you can say, okay, maybe these are the same note and let's go ahead and clean up some of that stuff before. Uh, but let's say when we come to the extract MIDI, I kind of use a lot of times the, um, you know, and if you want to get like really particular, you could just say, um, you know, like with pitch bend data, if you're outputting it to like a VST3 instrument. You could have a finer resolution for the pitch bend data there. But a lot of times, you know, th these are kind of default settings that I have set up for that. So I'm finding that it works pretty well. Um, and if you're talking about like with... Um, like with hit points, let's say if I want it to come here, let's say if I'm in hit points, um, we could adjust kind of our threshold 
accordingly. And let's say, you know, you may notice that, and here's where we have the intensity um, that, you know, and basically with this, we want to make sure that we're not, you know, as we're playing it, like we're not catching the bleeds. So the intensity, if I turn this, you know, we can see that it's not really going to follow. Um, so just think of the intensity often as maybe a way to get rid of bleeds if you're doing your uh, create MIDI notes directly from the uh, edit hit points. All right, wonderful to see Michael Pierce from Grand Chapel Studios. And he's in, involved with EBUR128 metering scales for advertisements. So. so we see from the Heartbreak Time Machine, uh, multi-correlation, oh my God, that's the one. So yeah, it's a very powerful meter. Um, just to kind of find exactly what particular frequencies are causing your phase issues. Okay, my chat field just jumped, so I'm just scrolling back. Great. So I think I'm back to where I was. Thanks for all the great questions. Again, if you've learned something new, make sure you hit the like button or subscribe to the channel if you haven't done that yet. All right. All right, so we have uh, Ralph Nelson Tucker says, uh, his question is, hi, I just stumbled across this, uh, really useful. What are your schedules? Greetings from the UK. So we do it um, every Tuesday and Friday, unless there's kind of some extenuating circumstance, but generally it's every Tuesday and Friday starting at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern, so that would be 6 p.m., I believe, in the UK. Uh, and we usually go for about four hours or until we run out of questions. And we, we kind of try to stop at four hours because the closed captioning will uh, not go beyond four hours. And people who rely on the closed captioning will get upset at me. So. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, is it possible to configure one controller on a MIDI remote device to control uh, one or more parameters at once on a plugin? Um, so, you know, there's different schools of thought with this that, you know, that could be problematic. Um, so I think it's still kind of set up to be. Um, one control per controller. Um, so let's say if I have plug in here. Yeah, and you know, I, I know sometimes it's tempting to want to do that, but it's, you know, I think it's still going to be set up for kind of one uh, particular, um, one particular parameter per controller because there's all sorts of 
unintended consequences that could happen. But it's, you know, a lot of people will just copy the automation to different parameters pretty easily. And sometimes, let me just test something here also with that. <clears throat> and sometimes it could be <clears throat> dependent on the plugin. So let's say if I'm here, yeah, so I think it's still, <clears throat> you know, some plugins will allow you to right click and I'll just try it on one more plugin. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me clear my throat. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. So let's say if we come over here to retrolog some of these where you could learn CC. Sorry about that. All right. Let me see if I can. Yeah, I have everything kind of configured, but I think it's going to be kind of one control per parameter and it's just a lot cleaner. But I understand why you may want to control multiple parameters. All right, uh, so we have a question, uh, it says, hi all. Um, I just got a new mic, it records into the left channel and I can't figure out how to make the recordings play on the left and right. So, you know, it could be that, you know, when you're doing this, uh, you know, check your audio connections, make sure that you have your output set to stereo and that it's uh, configured to, and you can do this in the control room that you have like your left and right, and you want to make sure that when you add a track, it's probably a, if you, you know, your microphone may be a mono source as opposed to stereo. So when you go to add an audio track, you want to probably make sure that it is set to a mono configuration, but the audio output is set to stereo. So if you set this to left, then it will only output that channel to the left output of the stereo. So, you know, try to, again, add track and choose mono as the configuration. Some mics may record in stereo. A lot of USB mics don't. Uh, and then make sure that you have it set to, like, a stereo out here in the audio outputs as opposed to a mono source. And if you let us know if, you know, what mic you have, that would be helpful, too. If it's a USB mic, um or if you're connecting it into an audio interface. See so block SSM just says cool. He's planning on using a mixer as well. So I just find it like, you know, I find it to be very clean. There's so much to worry about, like when doing a live stream that the last thing you want to worry about is kind of like, you know, the audio settings. So it's one of those things you can just kind of set and forget. So. See, Michael Teams is being generous with his ice cream donations today.
Yeah, and Michael Pierce also, this is with the mono track from the mic, you know, if it's being routed to a mono group as opposed to a stereo group, that could also uh, create that problem. All right, so we see, uh, um, says, uh, question, we have three computers, I guess comps, that's computers with Cubase on each. Uh, we play live, how can we synchronize them with the clock? Um, so if you want to synchronize, you know, the computers together, what you could do is just simply, you know, go to the transport, and you wanna go to the project synchronization setup. So uh, one easy way of doing this, so if you have a, audio interface that will um, accept, you know, time code, like SMPTE time code, you know, you could have one computer come over here and add an audio track. And you could just simply, and under tools, you'll have a plugin that's a SMPTE generator. So if I wanted to play now, this could output SMPTE time code. And, you know, the idea is that we could route this to, uh, an audio output, and then the other computers could take that SMPTE time code input. Um, but you could also just send MIDI MIDI time code, which is different than MIDI clock. So if you wanted to come over here, you could say, "Okay, let's go to the project synchronization setup," uh, and you know we could have this uh, you know MIDI clock MIDI time code destinations. You could take the MIDI cable from you know, from different, like two different MIDI output ports, send it to one computer, send it to the secondary computer and have those computers, when the primary computer is playing, you want to just tell the other computers to, uh, to activate external sync. And then at that point, it will uh, just simply uh, look for MIDI timecode to come in and then we'll, st and then the two computers will follow the master computer settings. Ideally, you'd want to also, if you're doing a lot of audio between the three computers, you want to have an audio interface and not a lot of like portable audio interfaces feature this, but ideally, uh, you'd want to have an audio interface with like a word clock input and output so that the clock can also be synchronized or you could synchronize the, the digital clock over like an ADAT light pipe connection or a SPDIF connection. Um, so, you know, if you have a way of externally clocking, that would guarantee much more precise synchronization. So. We see Michael Teams is saying 6 p.m. for the UK start time, except for the odd between the odd bit between daylight savings time. So I think daylight saving times in the US is 6 p.m. or on November 6th this year. So I'll try to remember to mention that so not everyone shows up an hour early or an hour late from the normal time. So Um, and I see Jazz Dudes also mentioned VST system link. So if you have digital audio connections and you want it to be sample accurately synced, this is another way. Not a lot of people have, and you could just simply use VST system link and that will sample accurately synchronize. Uh, but you, different computers may not have digital, you know, you need like a digital audio connection between the different computers audio interfaces. All right, so we see that the uh, routing with the vocal to mono was just a routing issue, so that's great. All 
All right, so we see Ralph Nelson Tucker just saying, I don't get MIDI inserts in Cubase Essentials. So, um, yeah, just, you know, if it's definitely worth the upgrade, you know, and we just got out of a sale of Cubase. It just ended like about two weeks ago. Uh, and we're currently in a Cubase or Nuendo promotion where you get Nuendo for 50% off. So if anyone's thought of jumping up to Nuendo, it's a great time to do that. All right, we have uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but someone from Greece, thanks for joining us. I don't want to butcher your name's pronunciation. Okay, let me just find my spot. My chat field just jumped. All right, so we have uh, Bruce Bruton uh, from Simi Valley, California, checking in. It says he took advantage of the killer sale and got pro free. Now I watch these streams trying to learn something. So I used to always stay in Simi Valley when our office was in um, Chatsworth. So my our boss used to live in Simi Valley. So we spent a lot of time there. Glad you got the promotion. Uh, so we see just a comment from Jazz Dude. Uh, was, was Cubase the first to have collaboration with other musicians in a web? So yeah, we did that in collaboration with uh, Rocket Network. So it's probably like 97, 98, 99-ish. So. And now we have it with the VST Connect Pro as well. Uh, question, uh, is it possible to use a controller dedicated for pad shop too? Uh, definitely. So, you know, once we have any instrument loaded, you know, a lot of times we could have eight dedicated, you know, like quick controls, but if you wanted to have just, you know, one really in-depth controller for, you know, um, for, you know, dedicated for pad shop because, you know, it does so much. You know, you may go, okay, I want these as eight quick controls, but you know, with the new MIDI remote system, you know, really all you have to do is, you know, select the parameter. And, you know, a lot of times you could just choose to, you know, pick up for MIDI remote mapping, you know, so, you know, you could definitely, you know, just come and let's see. Yeah, so when you right click on any of the parameters, you could just say pick up for MIDI remote mapping. So if you wanted to build just a dedicated controller just for pad shop, you could, you know, go into, you know, your MIDI remote settings here and say, okay, this, you know, when we go into our, uh, you know, assignment, so say I have this knob selected, I want it to, you know, pick up for MIDI remote mapping that's now automatically assigned. If I wanted to come here and have this pick up for MIDI remote mapping, and then, you know, you can, again, just come and be able to assign your different parameters just right there. So if you wanted to have, you know, dedicated controllers for each instrument, you can, so. See, 
Bruce just mentioning is uh, he's noticing all the help available and he likes it. So that's great. It's a wonderful community here. Okay, Michael Teams wants people to whack the like button and dent their forehead like John did. So just as long as John wasn't in pain, that's the important thing. Um, so we just see a uh, question. Is there something like Vienna Ensemble Pro included in Cubase to make one project on three uh, computers simultaneously. So I don't think Vienna Ensemble Pro does that, where it's going to be the, you know, one project. You know, I think you can have different instruments play, but I don't think it hosts the other DAWs. Um, so, but again, you could do the synchronization options or... You know, if you have, depending on your audio interfaces, if you have like digital connections between all of the interfaces, just go to your studio setup and set up VST system link. And then when you hit play on one, all three computers can be sample accurately synced. All right, wonderful to see Gareth on the live stream. So glad you can make it. All right, uh, so we just see a question. Uh, hey, Greg, could you please explain what all the tools in the top of the middle do? Thanks. Okay, so when we look at uh, like our first tool here, you know, we could have these first tool, two tools combined. I'll show them separately. So we have an object selection tool. This will allow us to select an event, move it around. We could also do fade ins, fade outs. If we hold down like the alt key, we can make a copy of events and just kind of select multiple events like so. The next tool we'll have is a range tool. This will allow me to select kind of a range of time and be able to edit those events, move them, delete them. Uh, and also if I wanted to come and say, okay, I wanted to get rid of this part, I could just hit like control command plus shift X and just kind of, you know, move these, get rid of this and move the parts afterwards directly there or just hit um, the backspace or delete to get rid of it so we could select ranges with this particular tool. Um, we have the pencil tool. This is often used for drawing in different automation points. So we could come here and draw in automation or on a MIDI event if we wanted to, you know, draw in change like the velocities of MIDI notes, or if we wanted to draw in uh, MIDI CC data, we could use a pencil tool for that. We could also use the pencil tool uh, directly on an event. So let's say if I'm here, I could draw in just like quick, dirty volume changes. I want that softer, louder. We could do just like that. The eraser tool will erase events. And a lot of these tools, if you hold down Alt, I could erase like all the events after this event here. So we could do some different mod. We could have some additional functions. We're going to have our scissor tool, which is will allow us to cut different events. So if I wanted to cut and erase, and if I always wanted to go back from any tools to my object selection, if I have this tool selected, I could just you know quickly tap. And that will allow me to jump back. Uh, we'll have our glue tool. This is often used for different MIDI events. If I, you know, have a number of individual events and I wanted to glue these together, grab the glue tool and I could do that. And if I, you know, wanted to, let's say, hold down the alt or option key and I wanted to split all the events. And if I wanted to hold down the alt or option key, and glue all the events so I don't have to do it one by one by one by one. You could do that. The X tool will allow us to mute events so that we don't hear them or to unmute. So when they turn white, 
that indicates that they're muted. We'll have our zoom tool so that we could just zoom in on particular events. And if you hold down the, you know, uh, let's see if I get, so this will allow you to kind of just zoom on particular ranges as well. So um, you can do that. This tool is going to be used for comping. So if you have multiple performances in like that are recorded into lanes where you do like three or four vocal takes or multiple guitar solos, you could just use uh, those particular ones. So let's say if, if I wanted to do a comp where I recorded multiple passes of a particular performance and I wanted to get the best bits of each of the performances, let me just change my zoom factor here so we can. So now when I wanted to uh, switch between different takes, I could, uh, when I have lanes, I could just say like this part of that, that of this, and we could select different ranges and audition different parts using the comp tool. Uh, the warp tool we could use to kind of change the different, uh, you know, grids. So let's say if I have a number of different events here. So, you know, there's going to be two main modes. One is where I can say this is where um, just take this out of musical mode here real quick. So if I wanted to actually come here and say, you know, with my warp tool, so if we have warp grid, I could say this is where measure um, like 48 starts uh, and I can move the measures based on the music or if I wanted to do different rhythmic correction on the music, we could do free warping where I could say, okay, I just wanted to come here and like this drummer hit too early here and we could kind of stretch the audio. Um, we'll have different line tools so that when we look at, if instead of just having a straight pencil for drawing in different events, oh, sorry, let's put this, activate this particular project. So we're going to have our uh, pencil tool to draw in events. We could also just have, if I wanted to do like a straight fade out, I could do that. Or if I wanted to draw in different shapes like parabolas. And if I hold down control, I could now adjust. Let's say I'll just turn my snap off here. So I could just say, okay, like this and... You know, so we could just kind of draw in a parabola or if we want to do like a sine wave <clears throat> and I could hold down the shift key to kind of change the frequency of that. So I could just say, okay, now, so we'll have different shapes for drawing in. So if I want to draw in square waves, we could do that. So I could say, okay, now let's just change the particular shape. So you could have square waves for different musical effects. We'll have the color tool and the color tool will allow us to colorize different tracks. So if we have, you know, this track selected, I could select the color tool and then just choose a particular color. And I could do that for multiple events. And just right here, we have all the color choices. So that's a quick run through of some of the functions of all of the tools. All right. So we see from uh, Ralph Nelson Torres says, uh, so I just bookmarked this page and come back here. Sorry, newbie. So all you have, if you subscribe to the channel, you should be notified. Uh, you know, this page will just be for this particular live stream. But if you subscribe to the Cubase YouTube channel, you should be notified 
of all of the events. So go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Okay. So Gareth K Music just saying, uh, Project Sync setup is revelation of the day. So yeah. All right, uh, so we have uh, from Keith Young, uh, his questions. It's great to have you back. Um, hello, Greg, I'm running Cubase 12 Pro and have in my document Cubase 12 installer. Can I delete the Cubase 10 installer to gain some storage without affecting projects made in 10? So yeah, you could, you could uh, if you needed to clean it up for hard disk space, so you, know, you could uninstall the program if you really needed to, or you could, you know, uh, go into the downloads and get rid of just the installers because you could always download uh, the installers at any time from the Steinberg Download Assistant. All right, so we see Pablo, the famous Pablo, or the drummer of Hot Mess, is nearing the end of his season for all of his gigs, so we're looking forward to having him back. See, Michael Pierce says, uh, oh, I always wondered what the SMPTE generator was for, revelation of the day. So a lot of times I will use, um, I remember setting up at Peter Frampton studio with his SSL, where uh, at that point, you know, we set the SMPTE generator up so that his SSL console could chase uh, its automation when he was kind of doing a hybrid approach at the time before he kind of migrated all into Nuendo. Uh, but that way he could have the time code going out of Cubase, uh, feeding the time code input of the console so the automation could chase his uh, Nuendo system. So, And I think it was, the story I heard was uh, Charlie Steinberg <clears throat> needed a, uh, like forgot his SMPTE box, his sync box at home one day, so he just wrote a plug in to do it. So must be nice to be that smart. So Gareth is just saying SMPTE is a blast in the past for him. So yeah, I spent many, too many sessions listening to SMPTE time code to make sure it's all good. All right. Okay, so we see Michael Pierce is saying uh, we're last Saturday of October or so. And Nick is sneaking in coffee into the discussion, so. He knows the rules. All right, uh, so we see a um, question uh, from Vidal BK. Uh, it says, hi, Greg, is there a way to uh, drop the audio sample inside the sampler track to the play line without setting a group channel and record it manually. Um, so, you know, if you have an audio file, let's, I'll just switch projects to show this quickly. Um, I'll just come over here, show this. So if it's like with a VST instrument part, um, all right, so let's say I have, um, just on my bass part here, I have one note. Okay, so I have one note and let's say I have a sampler track um so let's say this is my one bass note and i don't want to have to uh you know render it out or record it in real time um so what you can do is just take a vert a, a midi track uh that's routed to a virtual instrument or an instrument track uh and then just drop it in and now you could so you don't have to re-render it as audio. You could just drag the MIDI that's going to that particular um, instrument. So let's say I think I have some like pianos here, so I could just drag that down and now. So 
So let me know if that's what you mean. So, but you don't have to render it through a group track to record it in real time to get the audio. You could just drag and drop it right into the sampler track from just the instrument track. All right, Gareth says, Loop Mash has been smashed. All right, um, so I see Tim's question about, is there something like being an Ensemble Pro built into Cubase to make one project on three computers simultaneously? So, you know, Vienna, I don't think Vienna Ensemble Pro does that, so. All right, uh, so we see what plugins are exclusive to Nuendo? All right, so let me just open it up so we could show some of those. I may miss one or two, but we'll take a look. Okay, so let's find the Nuendo exclusive plugins. Let's see if I can remember them all. All right, so supervision will have some additional uh, metering functions. I think the delay plugins are all the same. Distortion is the same. The dynamics are the same. Uh, in the, um, and it might be under EQ is the same. Uh, there's going to be a post filter. And what this is good for, um, if we just, let's say if we have a particular frequency, what, what this is good for is now, um, like as you work with this, you could just, um, so if you're like notching out a particular frequency, like, you know, let's say a hum, you could now come over and have the overtone series. So you'd have kind of multiple notches. Um, so that's, you, that's a Nuendo exclusive. I think the dithering is going to be the same. Um, That might be different. Um, so under, there's a randomizer plugin. So um, like, let's say if you have one footstep and you wanted to uh, have multiple variations of that, so you could randomize a particular tone or like a snare drum <clears throat> and just say, okay, I want to take this one snare hit and do subtle pitch, pitch randomness on it. So that's pretty slick for that. Um, inside, there's also, I think Pitch Driver is Nuendo exclusive as well, and this is good for just doing like boo type of uh, effects on voices. And if you go to voice designer, this is for kind of making uh, like robot voices from a human voice. So more like a particular sound design. I think within reverence that there are some additional um, impulses. So if you wanted to go like, you know, small can and 
uh, furnished rooms, you know, more for like typical post-production, not just kind of music halls, but different impulses. Uh, so if you want to do like a machine room, um, so we, we have all of the, you know, public announcement system. So, you know, so some additional impulses within reverence. Let's get to, and there's a headphone match. So if you're doing uh, Dolby Atmos um, mixing, you could say, okay, I'm using my Audio-Technica M50 headphones. And then th that way you could use headphone matching to get more accurate when doing binaural audio mixing <clears throat> for Dolby Atmos. Um, <clears throat> there may not be a bass manager, so inside of Cubase. So here's like control over your LFE. Um, there's AnyMix Pro, which is more of a uh, an alternative surround panner. And I think those are kind of the Nuendo exclusive plugins. So let me know if that's helpful for you, Gareth. All right, um, so we just see, uh, hi Greg, I just dissolved my drum track to MIDI tracks, but now I can't mix these tracks in the Cubase mixer. They move, but don't do volume. All right, so let me just mimic that. Just revert this project. Thank you for all the wonderful questions so far today. Hope everyone's learned a new tip or trick. If you do, you make sure that you hit the like button. All right, so let's say I have, um, okay, so I'm going to now come and do a dissolve part. And this is gonna take each of the notes and we'll separate by pitches. All right, so and now as we do this, we just put it into. So here, uh, you can see my original part is up here that got muted and now the kicks, hi-hat, So my symbols. My snare. Then we could have fills, you know. And so we could have everything kind of just in new independent sources here so we go to the mix console just so we could see them all being independent so let me know if you're doing kind of the same way so the original one will get muted and then each of these will now be uh and you know if it's an instrument track uh it may automatically replicate the new instruments for each of the independent uh tracks that were created for each individual midi note so let me know if you're doing it differently than that All right, so we just see question, uh, how do to master the track? Um, so if you wanted to, you know, master the track, you know, Steinberg does have a dedicated tool called WaveLab, which is really kind of well suited for mastering. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, one of the best mastering programs that, you know, I can't remember how many Grammys were 
mastered entirely in wave lab so this is kind of a dedicated uh mastering solution of a program where we could do all of the metadata burning to multiple formats uh and if you wanted to you know master kind of inside of cubase you know there's a number of plugins that are often used if you want to do it inside of cubase um so a lot of the processing that you know, people would think of mastering is going to be maybe dynamics control, maybe a touch of EQ, some kind of widening. So if you wanted to do that, you know, um, we could, as we're playing back our track, I could just go to my master effects processing. Let's go to insert. So if I wanted to do like some surgical EQ, we could come over here to frequency. And we could even just audition just what we're editing, what we're affecting. And then we could have this on independent left, right. So if I wanted to come here, I could just do the left channel. And if I wanted to EQ the right channel independently on the same band. So you could do stuff like that, or if you wanted to do mid side, I could just say, now I'm gonna EQ the middle part of the panning spectrum, where I wanted to make the sides sound brighter. So you could do stuff like that, um, getting into different dynamics processing. So I'll say I'll just bypass that, but I'll say, you could get into more multi-band compression. So where you could compress each frequency range independently and in solo. So this way we could say, okay, I want to really compress, compress the low end, or you could even get into under dynamics, something like a squasher or razor is quite nice as well to get more gain. You know, so there's a number of different, you, know, you can get into also like the imaging to make it sound wider. So there's, you know, a number of different processes uh, directly inside um, inside of, of Cubase for that. If I misunderstood, just let me know. All right, uh, so we see Jerome Gibson is just saying, what replaced VStack? Um, so VST Live, which was just updated, I think, today to the 1.1 version. So not only will it do virtual instruments, uh, but it will play back backing tracks. It will control your lights. You could have lyrics. You could have chords. Uh, you know, so if you're, if you wanted it to, you know, control like your whole live production, check out VST Live as well. All right, so we see from Gareth, uh, he's interested in Nuendo, if it's possible to export projects as Cubase. So, you know, when you uh, when you have a .npr file, Cubase can open it freely, and Nuendo can open up, up Cubase project files, and I think you could even just type in .cpr at the end instead of .npr. And, but basically, the, the, the .npr Nuendo project file format and .cpr, the Cubase project file format, are interchangeable. Uh, so we have a question. Um, any drum loops come with Cubase 12? So yeah, you have tons of different drum loops. So I think just about all of these drum loops that you see, I may have a couple of third party, but we have like Urban Atmosphere, Soul Assembly. So you'll get a lot of these loops. Um, I think these might all be stock. Uh, the game sound effects is sold separately. 
but I think everything else, uh, Clang House might be sold separately, but just about all these are available to use and they're all royalty free to, uh, to apply and use in your projects. So. See, Gareth says, nice to hear Greg on the live stream. It's nice for Gareth to be here. He always has witty comments, so I appreciate that. Apparently, I'm the voice of reason and mindfulness. I'm just an Oompa Loompa in a world of Willy Wonka. So. Um, so we see a question. Uh, Hi, Greg. Is it possible to save templates in a new folder and make Cubase recognize that folder as default? Uh, thanks. Um, so, you know, when you go to, um, like, let's say we go to our hub to a new project. Um, so we want to keep the templates kind of in a central location so that it always shows up. Uh, and if you go install another version that the templates know, they know where to find the templates from previous versions so that they show up. But instead of having the projects in the hub default to recent, you could just click on more. And if you leave that, when I go to, uh, let's say I cancel this and I go to new project again, I could just see all of my templates and that will be the default view for you. So that way you, you know, you don't necessarily have to change it to a different folder, but the template will be able to be utilized by, you know, different, uh, versions of Cubase without having to do any reconfiguration. So you see Gareth just saying sampler track tastic. It's probably the dropping the um, straight from the instrument part right in. Okay. All right, so we see from Gareth, uh, is there a cross-grade deal from Cubase? So I think it's for new versions uh, on, and I assume this is with Nuendo, but I think currently, you know, now we have kind of the um, new versions of, uh, it's for new versions. I don't think there's cross-grades, but I could be mistaken. Uh, but if you just go and take a look at, like cross, you know, or upgrading, you know, from Cubase to Nuendo, you should see it listed there. But it might be cheaper now, you know, to to do that than to do the cross grade at other times or to do the uh, upgrade from Cubase to Nuendo. All right, so we have a question from John Costigan. It says, uh, after using the transpose transposer track successfully, I tried to copy and paste the changes to another region, and I was unsuccessful. What have I done now? So I haven't tried copying and pasting, but we'll take a look. So let's go ahead and add a transpose track.
right, so let's see if I select the range and hold down the alt. Yeah, so try, um, because it's gonna maintain the original value, John, uh, un until there's a value after. So if I don't have this, that information will, <clears throat> will just kind of carry on at like the value, the last value here. <clears throat> so what I'm gonna do is use the range tool and say, okay, I want these measures. And then I'm gonna hold down the alt or option key and just say, okay, I want that repeated there. So try try selecting it with the range tool. <clears throat> and then you could just move that range uh, wherever you want. So give that a try, John. Great question. See, Gareth has to go get his pizza. He's gonna be back in 10 minutes, but that was probably 15 minutes ago, all right. All right, so we have Avery checking in from Tel Aviv. Thanks for joining us today. So Michael Teens has a studio date today, so he has to take off in a little bit. Thanks for joining us. Always better with Michael Teens on. My Chatfield jumps, I'm trying to find my spot. <clears throat> so you see Michael Pierce is saying, uh, to me he says, reminds me of a lecturer who pretty much every time he had to listen to a WAV file would make a new max MSP window and create the player in there, you know, missing something, just code it. <laughs> yeah, kind of classic Charlie Steinberg. It's, yeah, it's nice to be that smart and such a wonderful human. All right. All right, so we see X Cubase X on and just thanking us for the, uh, for the wonderful hangouts. We're glad that they're helpful for people. All right, so we just see again, uh, can you change the default pitch range uh, for the sampler track? So I think it's gonna default till two, but you could always change it or open up a track preset and just drag it out. All right, so Michael Pierce asks, uh, if you own both Cubase and Nuendo and have them both installed, will the additional supervision components work in Cubase as well as Nuendo or indeed any of the plugins? Uh, so I think they're gonna be, the the supervision modules are gonna be still limit, you know, limited to use only inside of Nuendo and some of the R plugins once they're kind of fixed to the particular application. So you know, if I have Nuendo installed and Cubase installed, I don't have access to them inside of Cubase. So, but I'll mention that as a feature request that people want if you have both lic licenses. All right, great to see, uh, I think it's Randy from ProWash DFW. Glad you can make it today. All right, so we see a question from Jerome Gibson. Uh, voice designer, is that the same that came with Free Filter in VST5? Um, so I don't think Free Filter came, there was a voice, um, there was a, like a kind of a harmonizer, but the, it's a different plugin. The voice designer is kind of really for taking uh, different sounds and making it very robotic. Uh, there was a, I'm trying to remember the name of a plugin that was out shortly. It was kind of renamed several different times. 
I think it was Ultravox for at one period. Uh, but that was more of kind of like a harmonizing plugin that's kind of more akin to the cloner plugin that's currently in Cubase. So, uh, but the voice designer innuendo is completely kind of a different, uh, different type of plugin. Okay, uh, so we see what's the best way to create your own drum samples from a Cubase project. And this is from Jack Shot Records in British Columbia. Thanks for joining us today. Hope you're doing well. So, you know, luckily, you know, drummers who have done a lot of live gigs where they're mic'd up or they do studio work, you know, they, they're very acclimated to, um, you know, hitting their drums a lot, like as the microphones are getting set up. So I've seen people you know, like do a sound check for a drummer and then, you know, have an entire drum sample uh, set done while they're kind of working on it. So let's say if we have, um, you know, let's say I want to take a multi-track from this particular drum. So I want to take the kick and let's say I have three kick sounds here. So let's say as we listen to it and I have a sub kick and then So if I wanted to take just these particular, these three kicks that are layered, I'm going to disable my snap and I'm just going to zoom in. And with the range tool, I'm just going to select just the beginnings and then I could just drag and drop. And at this point, um, you know, we could I'll just make it a little longer here. So again, drag and drop, we'll have our samples. And I'll just unsolo. So, so right now I have the three different samples for the kick. Um, and if I wanted to, you know, easily kind of just layer these. So um, we're just saying, okay, I wanted this to start right at Right. And instead of having these kind of divided by velocities, uh, I could just choose to layer these. So now I could just drag and drop from my project window and I could obviously extend this out a bit. So, but just quick and dirty, just, you know, take a drum recording. Say, like, okay, here's my two snare tracks. Boom. Just drag it to the snare, put it into layer, One, two, and then you could be able to uh, just make your own drum kits. And then once you're all done with it, right click and export kit with samples. And that way, you know, if you're like, oh, you got a better drum sound last time, you could just say, oh, here it is. I sampled to you. Here you, you know, and be able to pull it up. All right, uh, so we just see a uh, question. Uh, Greg, track volume is automated. If I reduce uh, 2 dB on a volume fader, it's moving back to the previous position. I want the volume to be reduced automation and I want volume to be reduced with automation active. Um, all right, so I'll just revert this. You know, so, you know, there's a, if you have automation, you know, so let's say if I'm here uh, and I want to take, let's do the bass track so we could hear this. All right, so say I have my bass track selected, so I want to automate it. You know, there's different automation panels. So if you hit F6, you know, one of the things, if we have a lot of 
automation. I could just, you know, let's say I just haven't, you know, like it's the second verse by time I got to touch the bass. Um, I could just say automate to start and to end. So let's say I have my automation lanes here. So I don't have any automation. So I'm going to say that's our level. You can see kind of my little squiggly lines. But now that I settle on, on that level, I have now automation points at the beginning and at the end. Um, so, but if we have some additional automation here, and when we look at the automation, let's make this really big. All right. Um, but if I wanted to increase or decrease, but still kind of keep that automation, I could add like a VCA fader to this. So now when I'm here, uh, let's, I'm going to automate the VCA. I want to bring everything down. So now I could see kind of, if we look underneath, I could see my automation and I could see the result of what the VCA has just done. So if I actually just click on the VCA here, I could just say, let's combine the automation of the VCA. And now we could kind of have the original automation combined with the effect of the VCA. So let me know if that's what you want to do, Patrick. All right, so we just see, uh, hi, Greg, how do I fix out of phase tracks and how can I spot them? You know, so an easy way to do it is as we're, you know, as we're playing back different tracks. So, you know, figure out what tracks are kind of susceptible to being out of phase, like snare tops and snare bottoms. Um, you know, you could, you know, one of the beauties of, you know, like a software based system is, you know, you may notice that, some of the tracks, like when you look here, um, I'll just, we'll take this snare and I think this, let me find a kick that might be better choice here. Um, so we could see just visually that if we look at this track that the waveform here, they're all kind of going up uh, and going down. So like the wave is kind of in sync. Uh, but you know, if while you're playing the kick, you could also just come here and there's an invert phase right on the info line. So that will just kind of flip the polarity. So let's say if I'm just listening to the kicks and I choose to. So you get here kind of a lot fuller sound. And again, you could just come over and, you know, look at the different meters here. There's a number of different phase meters that you could have. So if you want to see like, you know, like what your overall phase scope is going to be on your project, you know, this could give you an idea of So if you're kind of looking at this and it's very kind of you know, vertical, or it's kind of on one of these axes that would give you an indication that there's phase issues. This is a pretty healthy phase relationship. And if I wanted to look at this and add, you know, like a different multimeter or multi-correlation, at this point I could see which exact frequencies. Like I have a little bit of phase in these particular frequencies. So that could be like my overhead mics. And also in every channel, like when you're looking at it in the big mixer, if you go to the pre area, so go to racks, let me just, and we go to the pre, you're gonna have a phase button on every, the polarity switch right here. 
that you could just mm -hmm. kind of flip and see if it sounds better, sounds fuller. So those are some techniques for phase. But realize that when you have two microphones on the same source, that those are going to be more susceptible to phase issues. All right, so we see uh, Benny just asking about the Apache SX. So we, we did that in the last live stream, but let me know if you didn't see that. All right, we see Spike Williams has to dash. Thanks for joining us, Spike. And we hope forward to, we look forward to seeing you on Friday. Okay, so I just see, uh, hi everyone, Greg, did you get my email about MIDI and installing on the second PC? So I think, yeah, I think I got it here. So let's go ahead and take a look. Let me just, oh, sorry, wrong computer. Um, so let me just go to those questions real quick. Okay. Um, Okay, so it just says, uh, question one, uh, I had a friend send me a piece of MIDI that will not follow the project tempo I checked. in. It, it's in musical mode. It does respond to tempo changes, but it doesn't follow the tempo. Even if I place the downbeat on bar one, it'll drift offbeat sync. Uh, can you help me understand what I'm missing here? It's driving me crazy. Tempo, the MIDI was recorded at 154 BPM. My project has tempo changes. Uh, so... Yeah, this is kind of a strange one because it was didn't really seem like the you know I'm not sure if the two if there is a problem with kind of the original tempo. So I see that in this project that we had uh, different tempo changes, and I just kind of I, I wasn't sure what the original drum sound was here, but so I just kind of placed it randomly on. Um, So, but here, when you kind of look at the events, they don't seem to really be following the grid in a project we have here is set to 128 beats a minute. That changes up to one. So we're at 136 and I think it goes up maybe to 144. So it doesn't seem like this is, you know, on the grid. So, you know, what I might do is to take this and do a quick tempo detection of it. Because um, I don't think that it's actually, you know, following, you know, any type. It seems like it's really kind of off on the grid itself. So let's say as we look at this and we do our tempo detection. And let me just. So, you know, it doesn't seem to really have a straight kind of correlation with what's going on. So let me just come to the tempo detection. And I don't have the original instruments. So this seems like kind of And some of these we may have to, or we have no data for it to, we may have to adjust. So let me just. 
So let's say, okay, I want measure 64 to be here, you know, so. So, you know, but it just seems like it's, you know, it's hard to get it to match because there wasn't a consistent tempo. You know, if we look at tempo here, um, you know, the tempo that's being detected is around 88 beats a minute as opposed to 154 beats a minute. And then, um, you know, and one of the things also, and you had sent some MIDI files. So now if I take all of my drums here, this is kind of, but I don't have like all of the, uh, the original instruments, but, and the one thing, if you're, when you're importing MIDI files, you know, the MIDI files themselves may have their own tempo information and they didn't seem to correlate with, you know, so if we have, I'll just revert the project um, as the project was sent to me. So I'm not sure if the MIDI information was you know, like so far kind of off, but say, you know, but if I change the tempo here, you know, to say 200, it follows accordingly. Um, but now when we go to import a MIDI file, Um, there's a preference here as well. So if the MIDI files themselves can't contain different tempo information, sometimes you, you know, so you may not want that to be imported. So when you go to import MIDI file, um, you know, we could just say ignore the master track events if you want it to follow the existing tempo. But it seems like when we do a tempo, so I'll import the MIDI, one of the MIDI files that was sent with this example. Oh, sorry, let me just. And we'll merge it into So this should play back just a piano part, like a piano voice. Sorry, let me just come here. And I'll just switch this to like a bass part. I'll transpose this up. Switch the sound, sorry. So when I import that, that's kind of following the Temp the original tempo, but it's not just oh, sorry, this is All right. So sorry, let me just get this to the correct drum sound, so let's do kind of just a generic drum set
All right, so I'm gonna import the bass to it now. So we'll import a MIDI file, and I'm just gonna put my cursor at the beginning here. And let's import the bass part. Sorry, you messed up there, made it more confusing. So we're not gonna import that. We're not gonna create a new project. So now we have like a bass part. So I'm not sure if these were recorded together or recorded. It seems like they were recorded at completely different tempos. Um, so I don't know if you have the capability of maybe give me mo a little more background on, you know, because it's not. So it just seems like maybe these are, you know, it seems like the piano and bass are together, but they aren't recorded with the drums or maybe someone had the MIDI file or something different. So I don't know if you have any more information on how the process was for that, but that would be helpful. Um, you know, we had a second question with this is, uh, what is the easiest way to install Cubase Pro 12 on a second machine? I have an e-licensor, but believe and prefer that it could be installed without this. Uh, I'm confused as my Google, there are several conflicting recommendations. Uh, so, and question 2.1, if my second machine is a clone of the first, will this be confused with Cubase or should it work? So if you have a clone of it, you'll just need to go into, with Cubase 12, it doesn't utilize the e-licensor at all. You may have some plugins that do, uh, but they are kind of transitioning as we speak to most of it being on the new Steinberg licensing system. Um, so you can just simply go on your second computer and you'll be prompted if you want, and you have three activations with Cubase Pro 12. So go to your Steinberg activation manager and activate your second machine. So you could just install it and activate it and you could be running it on three separate computers. All right, let me jump back to the questions, but maybe Doug, if you get a chance to like get maybe more details, but it seems like those parts just don't line up. So when I change the tempo, they all change, but I think that they're recorded completely differently. Um, and there's maybe a mistake as it was being recorded. Okay. All right, it's just trying to catch up here. Um, all right, so we see from a uh, question. Uh, Hi, Greg, wondering whether you had any recommendations about best practices during comping a vocal. I always end up with a few weirdly long crossfades or crossfades between the wrong events. So I'm not sure if you're doing the comping in lanes but if you do that this is probably the best way of doing it just close this project reopen it It seems like it's missing my audio file. Maybe I accidentally erased it. But once you have everything in lanes, we could activate kind of like auto crossfades 
from directly here on the actual um, on the track and then you want to just grab the comping tool and be able to like these will each be different takes or performances and then you could just simply select your different parts and then once you have this auto crossfade that should handle all of the crossfades between the different events See, Gareth just saying his useless eyes never saw that invert phase switch. Okay, just reading through some more comments. Uh, so we see a uh, question. Hi again, uh, Greg. Will there be any more giveaways? So I, I don't have any scheduled. You know, that was kind of a special thing for... Uh, you know, we did software giveaways just for the 250th uh, live stream. So that, that's not a typical thing that we do. So it's very generous to Steinberg to give away five uh, software titles. So it's, you know, it's, you know, so, you know, so, uh, but yeah, you know, we'll give free knowledge away every live stream. So, okay. Okay, so we just see uh, Greg, yes, it, it, with his automation, says Greg, yes, it helped. Uh, what I'm struggling with is volume is automated. When I moved the fader down. It's it's going back to its previous position. Uh, need to reduce volume fader for dB without deleting its automation. All right, so, you know, you know, figure it's going to follow its automation. Um, but if you wanted to, if you had automation and you wanted to just adjust it down, you know, one other way of doing it is just to select... So let's say, okay, we had a lot of automation going on here and I wanted to take just this range of automation. You could just bring it up or down directly like that. If you want to do it by specific DB values, you could say, okay, I want to take all of these and you could say, okay, the values at minus uh, 16.1, minus 12.1, you know, or sorry, minus, so, or you could just simply come here and you could also just go into, you know, the logical, the project logical editor. So if you have like, you know, automation selected, you know, so it's, I think it's easy enough just to kind of say, okay, I want this up or down just by grabbing it in the upper center. So, you know, let me know if that works for you, Patrick, and I could show you a way in a logical editor if you really wanted to do it. But, you know, figure if you're automating it, it's going to jump back to, you know, its automated value. So if you say, okay, I want it, this all to be down, just simply grab it from the upper center. So let me know if that makes sense, Patrick. All right, wonderful to see Tiago from Brazil. All right, Sable Winters is on. Great to see her from Bay Area, Northern California. She's like number 105. All right, we see Damir is just switching over from Studio One. Thanks for being a part of our Steinberg community. See Gareth's comment that I'm recreating the Jaws soundtrack. So my son is good at playing that on his upright bass for strings in school. Right, irritates his string teacher. He's well ahead of the pizzicato open strings.
Great, just reading through comments. Thanks for all the great comments here. All right, so to see from uh, Duggo, just with that previous one that the bass and piano recorded at 154 beats a minute. So um, were the drums recorded at 154 beats a minute? Because I could get, um, so like when I do a new project here and I import, and I'll just have it go, and we'll see if uh, if I change the preferences and I'll not have it ignore the master track. So I'll go to the beginning of the project here. And I'll just go to import MIDI file, we'll create it here. So let's see if we... So like even at 154, it doesn't sound right. Let's see if I kind of line these up at the beginning of the project, you know. Also, let's take a look at the tempo track here. So you can see that in the tempo of the MIDI file itself has tempo changes. So it is recorded at 120 beats a minute and then jumps up to 154. But let's see if I... I'm just going to put this in again and see if that's where. So I'm not sure if they're all supposed to start at the same time. So I'll just import the MIDI files again. Sorry, I won't create. I'll just put it into this project. Okay, so so that's where the MIDI file is, and let's look at a tempo track again. So it's recorded this whole time before at like 120 beats a minute. And then slightly before it plays, this is the timing of it. But even this isn't at 154 beats a minute. It's, I mean, if I turn the click off, like the bass part and the piano will sound okay together, but this isn't, there's no correlation to 154 beats a minute to the actual um, events. So if I take, let's say the um, piano part and do a tempo detection of this,
So it's just not, you know, even without the tempo detection, it's not really steady at 154 beats a minute. And I think that's kind of the problem is internally, it's just kind of floating around. It's not really, I don't think it was recorded really at 154 beats a minute, Doug. So let me know if that makes sense. All right, so we see Mr. O just asking for uh, changing, for wanting to be able to change the names in the future updates. Uh, I think we discussed that in a previous live stream as well recently. All right, so Christopher Nielsen asks, uh, is there a way to enable or disable all tracks within a folder by selecting the folder and using a key command? Um, all right, so let's go ahead and take a look. So let's say I have a folder for all my drums in this project. So I think we could do it with the project logical editor. So let me just revert this. Okay, so all of my tracks here are in a folder. So let's say, okay, so let's create, um, let's go to a project, <clears throat> to project logical editor and see if we could create this. So let's say, um, so we do transform. Container type is equal to folder track, and then let's say property is parent object is selected, and then track operation we want to just. Okay. All right, so I'm going to select all of this and then go to audio. Disable and able track. All right, so let's see if this works. So I have my folder track selected. And we'll say set to parent object is selected. All right, let me just. May have done one already. All right, so I think I've done this before, but let me see if I remember. I think I have one that's on the Discord preset for this, but let me just.
All right, there we go. All right, so you want to choose select. All right, so you want to choose select as your field here, and then we want to say um, media type is equal to audio, the parent object is selected. So let's say if I just have this, Yeah, so we had the folder selected. So we want to say select uh, media type equals audio property. Property is set to parent object is selected. In this case, the parent object is the folder track. Uh, and then on the post process commands, we'll choose audio slash disable slash enable track. So you could just come here. That will disable all tracks or enable all the tracks. I'll save this as a preset. So let me know if that helps. All right, uh, so you just see uh, about the comping with the fades. It says I don't use auto fade since it doesn't show me the fades visually, which bothers me. Uh, my issue, my issue is that once I set manual fades, it changes the event lengths. All right, so let's say, all right, so I'll just make some fake lanes here. Oops, sorry. Okay, so let's say if I've now done, let's say, comping here. So let's grab my comping tool. Okay, so maybe if you select with the range tool and then hit X that you'll define the length of the crossfade accordingly like that. So if I come here, let's say I want to go for measure 33 through 35. So I'm just going to grab the range tool here that that maintains the length of the crossfade. So try selecting the fade range. So let's say if I zoom in here, I'll just do like one beat on either side. I'll just switch my switch my grid here. So let's say I have one beat in either side, and then I think that the crossfade will automatically maintain the one beat. So let me know if that's helpful. All right. Um, so we have a uh, question, how can I flip the phase for an audio mono track? Um, so again, really all you have to do is any of the tracks, if you just go to the channel settings, you can flip the phase directly on the channel settings. Or you could just, again, when you have the event selected, be able to flip the phase right there. Uh, and we have another question, how can uh, switch an audio stereo track to mono? Um, so, you know, if it's gonna be a, if you have like two events, like a stereo track, 
you know, you say you have mono and stereo tracks and that could, you know, be contingent also on uh, like different effects processing. But let's say if we come here, we want to convert the stereo track to mono. I could just at this point um, get a project and convert. And you could just say multi-channel to mono and it will just split it into mono tracks for you. Okay. Okay, so uh, we have a question. It says, I have an audio track with automation. I want to copy the audio to later in the song, but without the automation. Okay, so let's say I have this audio track and I have lots of automation and we want to copy but not include the automation. So to do that, just go to you, uh, your edit menu and just uncheck automation follows events. And now when I copy the event, the automation won't follow. So again, just go to your edit menu and you'll see a check box, a little check mark for automation follows events. So you could have that toggled on or off. So just toggle it off and then you could move events without the automation automatically following. All right, so we see a question from Sable Winters. Uh, I downloaded the Howling in Six trial. Where is the Mellotron flute? Is it vintage strawberry? So let me just check. I think this is the one from Beatles and Stones. So let me just open it up just to make sure. Let's see if it's in my li recent list. All right, I'll just find it here quickly. All right, so let me just find the. This is the patch that Sable's looking for. It says Strawberry Flutes is the patch. So try that's the one I used, uh, Strawberry Flutes. Uh, and it's a great kind of Mellotron. instrument that comes as part of Hallian. So try that, Sable. Let me know how it works. All right. Uh, so we see question, is there a dual mono mode for plugins like in Logic? Um, so some plugins will have a uh, you know, dual mono mode. So if I wanted to open up uh, frequency, so let's say if we come here, you know, frequency, I could switch to be, you know, left, right for each band. So each band could be processed independently. So a lot of plugins will do that. If the plugin, or we could have it do mid side. Um, if the plugin doesn't have that capability, what you could do is let's say on a stereo track, come over 
Um, so let's say if I wanted to do um, different processing on for dynamics on my left and right channel. So let's say I'll have a compressor here. And, you know, in this situation, we could use two different compressors uh, and then go to routing. And we could choose each of these to be mono. And then as we double click, we could just say, okay, this is gonna process the right channel. This one's gonna process the left channel. So once again, just load up two different plugins and then, and this gets to be like really handy, especially when you're doing Atmos stuff because you could have, and working in surround because you could have different processors uh, in your surround field as well. So, um, so just, kind of uh, go to the routing, double click, and then you could choose whether you're gonna do it 5.1, stereo, quad, mono, and you could pick what exact channel. So you may wanna do it on all your channels except like the LFE, stuff like that. So, but that's how you could do kind of dual mono processing. I know it's probably a little different than other programs, but that's how you can make it work. All right, so we see a uh, question. Uh, are snapshots inclusive of all aspects of the project, including arrangements and status of tracks and parts? I want to achieve a full snapshot of the entire project without saving a different version. Um, so usually like in the snapshots, I'm not sure if it's the mixer snapshot that you're referring to, uh, but the mixer snapshots are gonna be just for the state of the mixer, like a static picture of the mixer, including the effects, the EQs, the sends, the inserts, uh, the channel strip, the EQs, all those things. So it's not globally on like the whole project. That would just be a you know a project itself. Um, but if you don't want to um, so the snapshots is just for the mixer settings. It's not going to include the data for automation or audio edits or MIDI. So, All right, so you see Michael Teams has to take off for his session. So we'll see you on Friday. Um, all right, so we see from Doug O on a project, uh, is there a way to force it to a static tempo? I can redo the drums and bass, but I wanna use the piano. Um, so, you know, I mean, probably the best bet with MIDI stuff like that is just to quantize it. But if the performance is fluctuating um, so much, but let's say if I, let's, we'll jump back to the project with the different tempo changes. Um, or I'll just come over here and say, let's go to, um, I'll just do a new project or I'll just import a MIDI file. We'll create a new project and I'll say, okay, we want the piano. All right, so let's say we'll play this. So I'm gonna just do a quick tempo detection of this. So you may have to manually go through it. I mean, because the tempo is pretty erratic with this and you know, like the pauses. So if we are kind of in, you know, you may have to just kind of manually, you know, in some situations when, you know, it's so kind of off, um, I would suggest just grabbing, you know, the warp tool here and just, you know, say, okay, this is measure three. And this is measure Four. So you could just kind of so you can say, okay, this is maybe 
So, you know, and some, because this is fluctuating pretty heavily and there's spaces. So say, so you know, So like even there's like a huge kind of gap in time. So you may just have to kind of manually map it. And let's say, okay, here. So you can see that there's a lot of different tempo changes. So I would manually do it and then you could, once you have kind of the mapping, then change it to a steady value. And I think you'll be in good shape. So give that a try, Doug. Yeah, it's kind of a challenging one. Great. See Patrick Emmanuel A just saying Greg and Cubase are wonderful. So thank you for the kind words. Michael Pierce is now talking with Italy about EBUR128. So if you're not familiar with that, that's kind of a European Broadcast Union uh, TV standard for meters and levels. So. All right, Peter has to run. Glad you can make it. Happy shopping with your wife. Okay, so we see Steve Cummings. Great to see you on the live stream. Uh, I have an oddity with the chord track. When I drag an audio file guitar into the chord track, it analyzes and shows chords, but the playback is a half step up from what it is should be. Um, so check just out of curiosity, Steve, if there is a sample rate mismatch. So usually if it's kind of a half step off, it's close to like a 44.1 to 48K. So make sure that the actual guitar uh, is playing back at the same sample rate. Uh, let me know if it's if you're sure of the sample rate and try just changing sample rate and see if that um, makes any difference. But it could be a sample rate issue. Okay, so Keith Young just asked, uh, uh, under documents, I have Cubase 10.03 installer disk image, 21.49 uh, gig in size. Why so big? And can I delete this safely, please? Yeah, you could definitely delete that. Uh, and that's the installer. And why it's so big is because all of the content, the different sounds, the you know Groove Agent sounds, the Howling S Sonic SE content, all the drum loops are all included in there. So... So but you could safely uh, get rid of that. You could always re-download it later if you absolutely need to. All right, uh, so we see copy uh, question from XQSX, uh, copy uh, audio without automation up. Uh, edit automation follows events. How simple and fantastic. Thanks. Uh, out of curiosity, but what if I want to do some automation lanes and not others? So I think what you'd have to do is, you know, copy the ones that you want with automation, change the status to disable it. 
and then for the ones that you don't, you know, copy it with them disabled. So I think you could actually have a keyboard shortcut um, uh, to toggle the status if you wanted to, and you might be able to make a macro, um, but it might be more trouble than it's worth. All right, so we see from Damir G just says, hate leaving, but my time is up. Thanks, Greg, for your time and patience with all of us uh, testing your knowledge. So I'm, I'm just happy to help people. So like Hans Zimmer told me once, he's like, you know, once you get to a certain level of knowledge in something, it's your obligation to help others. So I think that's a, a great thought and a great concept. So hopefully I'm helping people. Uh, and we see uh, from Damir G also adds, uh, thanks to all the others as well. Great crowd. We'll try to become regular. So we hope to see you uh, on the live streams in the future. All right. Um, so we just see, uh, hi, Greg. Met you about 12 years ago in Mississauga, Canada. Uh, glad you're still helping us out. Which model of Mac are you using for streaming from today? Yeah, I haven't been up to Canada in a while. So is that outside of Ontario? So I, I've been to, or is that outside Toronto? So I've been to Toronto and Montreal and uh, Vancouver um, and, and love going there. So it's such a beautiful, beautiful country. But uh, the Mac that I'm using, um, I recently just got it updated. So I'm running a, an M1 Max, 14-inch uh, with 64 gigs of RAM and a two terabyte drive. Generally, we have to have like our uh, Mac work for two and a half years. They kind of the company leases them uh, for you know for Yamaha Corporation of America where I work. Um, so you know I try to get the biggest one that I can, knowing that you know the software will be kind of pushing the edge more so than you know people doing spreadsheets in Excel. All right, uh, so we just see question. Um, I have a five minute drum recording as a stereo track, but the drummer has timing issues. Is there a way to fix the timing automatically by a function? Fixed manually is too much work. Okay, so what you could do is, you know, do a tempo detection of it. So imagine this is just a drum part. Um, so right now we hear that the metronome has no correlation at all with the audio. So I'm gonna come to do tempo detection. So analyze. Then I'm gonna do an offbeat correction. So now I have the tempo. And now I'm gonna to go to the audio menu to advanced and say set definition from tempo. And now instead of it following the tempo changes, I could just type in a steady value. So I want this to be 144. Now it's playing back perfectly at a steady tempo. So select the event or events, go to project to tempo detection. Once that's been done, uh, then go to audio to advanced, set definition from tempo, and then it will kind of follow whatever tempo value or setting that you have in the project. All right, you see Michael Pierce will be joining us on Friday. Um, Okay, uh, so we see from Mr. Morpheus, uh, can you show me how to just print internally from one track to another? Um, so if you, you know, if you don't have, if it's a track that's not created, you could just simply select 
uh, the events and go to render in place. Let's go to our render settings and we'll just say, okay, I want to do my channel settings and this will automatically kind of render this particular track out for us. And then as we do that, it will create a new track and we could have it mute the existing track. So that's kind of one way to get it onto a different track. Um, and, or if you wanted to uh, assign this to a group, so I'm gonna right click, go to add track, and we'll add a group channel to the track. We'll make it a stereo group. Um, I'll call this print. And now I want to add an audio track. We'll make it a stereo audio track and it's input. We're gonna use our print group. So I could come over here, record onto this track. So now the audio from this track is going through our print group and the print group is the audio input onto this track. So that's another way to do it. So let me know if those are helpful. All right. All right, so we see from Steve Cummings, uh, it just says it's the same sample rate as the project. Uh, when I load Contact or Howian, it plays a correct pitch, but using the chord track, it's off. Uh, project is from an old version of Cubase, uh, Cubase 4, if I remember. Yeah, see, if you have the, the capability to, you know, if you have an option to, like, send me, like, a, a download link to the file, I'd be happy to take a look at it and see. But it sounds like something strange is going on, but it's usually kind of not the case. Um, but if, you, if you're able to kind of share the project, uh, I'd be happy to kind of take a look. And you could, I think you have my email address, or you could send it to clubcubase at steinberg.de. Okay, so you see uh, Michael Pierce just saying before he leaves, uh, had a conversation with a friend earlier. Is there anything that Yamaha doesn't make? Um, they don't make an acoustic string bass. They make an electric silent string bass, but that's the one, I think one of the few instruments that they don't make. Um, so, but I think just pretty much every musical instrument. So it's great to be involved with a company whose you know primary focus is to you know, create more musicians in the world. So I have to give kudos to Yamaha for that. All right, uh, so I just see, uh, Greg, do you use the Apple Magic Mouse? Uh, so frustrating that we can't zoom vertically, only horizontally. Um, so I don't use an Apple Magic Mouse. I really, you know, if there was a mouse that I actually hate it and really disliked and would, you know, it would be the Apple Magic Mouse because it's really finicky with, and, you know, I think it's over precision it often leads to errors. Um, so I understand it's, you know, frustrating that, you know, we could zoom kind of with, you know, horizontally, but not vertically with kind of keyboard modifiers. Um, I'll make sure to kind of, you know, reiterate that point again. It, you know, it seems like an really obvious thing. I'm not sure why it's not just a different modifier for, for zooming vertically like that, but it's not necessarily uh, just with the Apple mouse. It's consistent for all mice. See, Sable Winters just says, oh, wow, just learned a valuable lesson on tempo detection. Thanks, Greg. All right. Hope it was helpful. All 
All right. Uh, all right. So uh, we have a question. Uh, hi, Greg. Uh, Joe here from Rochester, New York. Uh, great to see you on the live stream. Uh, could you please demonstrate how to use the match EQ feature in the included Voxengo Curve EQ? All right, so let me take two different projects here, or I'll just do a new project. And let me just import some audio files here. All right, so let's say I have two different audio tracks here, um, and these will probably have different EQ curves. I'll just turn it down. So let's listen to. And. All right, so I'm gonna come over here. Let's take a look. So let's say we want to make like maybe um, the sound of this file apply to that one. So let's come over to our mix console, uh, and I'm just gonna insert the Voxenga Curve EQ. All right, and I haven't done this in a while, but let's set it to average here. Uh, and I'm gonna play kind of the first file. So let's say I wanted to take this file. And once it kind of settles in here, All right, so I'm gonna click on the static and match, and we'll do that as a take. Now I'm gonna solo the other track. So we see kind of our different curves interpose on each other. And now what I want to do is to have that as a take. Um, and I want to use this one as the reference and apply it to this one. So now as we listen. So without it. So put it into average mode, and then once you kind of play the different files in, at this time uh, you set one as a reference and apply it to the other file. So give that a try, Joe, and glad you can make it on the live stream. Great to see you. Thanks for being a loyal attendee after all these years.
Okay, so we just see, uh, and this is probably with the drum question with the different tempos. Uh, it says, thanks on our, all the false timing hits. Example, bass drum or hi-hats are fixed in the rendered track, like quantize. So often that will kind of do the trick. But once you're there, you could also, if you need to quantize the audio, um, I would say that that will often make it steady and kind of, you know, take care of stuff and still have it sound natural. But you can't quantize the drums if they are kind of changing afterwards if needed. So it can be quantized after that's been done. Okay, so a question, uh, a fun question I had in mind for you is, what are the ways you know to use high pass and low pass filters within music making? Uh, for example, if there are things others maybe don't do, I'd love your input. Um, you know, so one thing that a lot of people will do is, um, you know, and, you know, cause a lot of times like low pass, you know, like, you know, having low frequencies can be a little um, annoying uh, and could cause a lot of kind of muddiness. That's, you know, but a lot of people don't think to do it in the effects return channels. So let's say if we have. So a lot of people don't think to necessarily do like. So let's come over here. Say this is going into. Oh, I remember the day that we went. Seems like a long, long time ago. You know, but In using. Our first kiss, there was no regret. Right after that Garth Brooks show. You told your daddy and he called my mom. Said so you come were here too to damn this one. good for any boy that my way and your heart shone through. It caught my breath while you called me too. Yeah, so this is already done here in this. Already well, did it. Now I'm so in love with you. And we'll make this. Just like a long, long time ago. So oh, I remember the day. Do you recall the day we first met? So using kind of like long, long you know the low cut ago. on the verb is always a great thing to do. School park you know, and I know you know people on. who you know great mixers who religiously will cut everything. You know, do a uh, kind of a high pass filter on everything except maybe kick and even on bass we'll kind of do it a lot so okay okay also we have a question while I'm at it what makes MIDI instruments come alive um you know, so I think one of the big things that people miss out on is, you know, velocity, you know, like drums, you know, like, you know, you could do so much with MIDI drums if you're like, you know, very aware of the velocity. So it's really easy for people to do. I'll just create a bad drum program. I'm good at creating bad drum programs. Uh, but let's say, I want to just create a quick. All right, so I'm gonna just blow this up so we could see it a little better here. All right, so you know the typical thing that everyone does is let's say okay we want to um, come to kick. All 
All right, and let's do. All right, so really super generic and boring. So let's say, okay, I just want to do. All right, so so many people program their drums like this. All right, why not just come over here and put in um, just like a little stick drags. And let's say the hi-hats, always extra annoying, you know, if you just kind of take. You know, we didn't change the timing of a single thing, but you know, you could just kind of come over here just kind of get natural, some natural variations. So little stuff like that, like velocities, I think on bass parts, you know, um, obviously a lot of people like to have uh, stuff compressed um, to kind of make sure that the foundation doesn't drop out. So let's say if you had a bass line, it looked, um, you know, something, You know, and all of a sudden where there's the gap, like the whole kind of foundation drops out. So if you kind of select all of the notes here and go to MIDI and go to functions and there's a legato. So at that point, now the notes will be held out until the next note will start. So those are like, you know, a couple little things you could do really easy to make MIDI instrument tracks really kind of stand out. All right, uh, so we see, Greg, uh, how to gain stage if the plugin itself doesn't have gain control. You know, so if you're on a, let's say if, you know, the plugin doesn't have gain control is, you know, just you have 16 inserts. So you could always just, you know, come over here and say, okay, you know, this amp doesn't have uh, gain control on it. So let's say we go to... Um, you know, like I, I wanted gain control before this amp, just load up a different plugin that has gain control and put it before or after that particular plugin. So if I wanted to have more gain going into the guitar amp and then, you know, adjust the gain afterward to get it, the signal in the amp, well, you know, to kind of ramp up the signal and then to bring it down directly afterwards. You know, you get, you have 16 insert slots to work with. So you could just come here and adjust, you know, adjust the gain. This is, isn't the right parameter, but you could just adjust the gain parameter on the plugin before and after if needed. See, Sable is just saying Voxango curve EQ is above her pay grade right for now. So you, you you own it. So, you know, feel free to use it. So it's within your budget already. So. All right. So we see feature request for a frequency plug-in to be resizable and solo isolate frequencies with click plus key. Uh, click plus alt, for example. So yeah, I've, I've kind of passed on the resizable uh, factor. So um, so we'll see if that gets kind of taken into account. Um, all 
and I'll just check see if there's um, so you know but I, I think that as you adjust stuff with this on that you could uh, you know just isolate to hear exactly what you're hearing within the frequency so it may be different to solo isolate frequency so let's say if I'm here You know, I could, let me just bypass. So, you know, while this is enabled, you know, now I'm only hearing what I'm adjusting as soon as I let go of the mouse. So you put it into listen mode. So check that out as well. You didn't know that. Yeah. See, Mr. O just says, I just heard some epic country style vocals. Great work. So yeah, that's uh Sable's agreeing. So that's actually uh my friend Wen my friend Wayne Estes. So he was the first guy I know that had like a, a MIDI sequencing rig on his computer in college. So he got me into computers and music and you know, I was the bass player in his band and now he's a bass player and a music teacher. So we kind of switched roles, but still great friends like thirty three years later or so. So but yeah, no, Wayne Estes, E S T A E-S-T-E-S, -E and you can check out Catoctin School of Music in Leesburg, Virginia. Him and his wife, Janine, run that, so it's a wonderful music school. So you can go on our website and say hi that you like this song. All right, so I think I'm at the end of questions. I'm going to make sure I think I got all the mailed-in questions already done. Let me make sure. All right, so I think I'm at the end of questions. So we see we had 2019 views so far. Uh, so thank you for that. And we have 134 likes. All right, so let me just make sure we don't have any other questions coming. All right, I see. I'm always proud to get the uh, the trophy from Agent K when I get through all the questions. All right, we see a nice comment from Christopher Nielsen. Thanks again, Greg, for being here and answering my questions. So we're glad to help. All right, wonderful to see Jeff Sabelski from Chico, California. Let's see, Barbara, Jeff Zabelski says Barbara Streisand is cross-eyed because she focuses, focuses the tone of her voice uh, at the tip of her nose. So, yeah, actually, uh, my friend uh, does does work with her in, in Cubase. So. All right, you see, Nick just wants to wish everyone a great week. We'll see if there's any other questions that come up. I want to thank everyone for all the great questions. And we'll be doing this again on Friday. Great to see Gerald Ely on. He was lurking in the background while multitasking. So, And thank you for the kind words, Benny. All right, I'll give it our, I know there's a delay from when I speak. We'll see if there's any more questions that crop up. If not, we will go ahead and wrap up a little early. Yes, uh, Jeff Sabelski, if you didn't watch Friday's live stream, you are one of the 200, we had our 250th live stream on Friday, and you were the subject of a question of what your primary instrument was, and Sable got it right, so...
All right. So with that, I guess we will go ahead and wrap up. So we'll uh, do this again on Friday. Uh, starting at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern. It's great to see so many new faces and so many regular attendees. Um, seen a great comment from Jackshot Records. Hasn't been a single live stream where I haven't learned multiple new things. Thanks, Greg. So you're welcome and we're glad that you could join us. And uh, But we'll go ahead and wrap up. We want everyone to stay safe and healthy. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on Friday and helping you with all of your Cubase questions. Take care and see you on Friday. Bye.